All right. Now joining the show, we have on a Notre Dame football legend and former Chicago Bear, Chris Zorich. Chris, how are you, man? I'm doing really good. How about yourself? I'm doing great. Happy to get you on. Um, you're one of the first players my dad ever told me about uh, when I was getting into football. We're both diehard Notre Dame fans, so uh, I'm super happy to get you on. Nice. That's awesome. It's great to hear that it runs in the family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, saw him, I've only been to one game, saw him play Rutgers in the uh, pinstripe ball, I believe in 2012, but nice. definitely hoping to get out to South Bend sometime soon. Yeah, that'd be nice. And, and hopefully we, we all have a chance to get there because, uh, yeah, you know, they didn't have fans the last couple uh, or the last season. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah. So uh, you've got a pretty diverse background. Uh, you grew up in Chicago, uh, went to Notre Dame, played in the NFL, and now you're helping out a lot in the community in Chicago. It seems like uh, you're a Division One, you were a Division One athletic director. So you've lived, you've done a lot of different things, which I think is pretty awesome. But I like uh, starting kind of back at the beginning of somebody's life when I'm doing an interview. Um, huh. You grew up in Chicago. Uh, African American and Croatian background. So growing up, how was that? Did that like kind of influence your life? Uh, it was really interesting because I kind of grew up in a rough neighborhood, um, mm -hmm. a lot of gangs, a lot of drugs, um, unfortunately. And it was really kind of a, um, an environment where you really wouldn't want to have folks growing up in. So my, my mom and I were on public aid. Mm -hmm. um, she only received about 240 bucks a month or something like that and as you can imagine with I mean our rent was like 160 or something like that so there was very little uh very little money uh yeah. to to kind of keep the lights on and feed feed me and as you can see I'm not the smallest kid in the world <laughs> so it was a challenge uh but somehow my mom did it and now there were times we had to dig through the garbage for food Mm -hmm. uh, it was really rough and um, somehow we were able to kind of get through that and I kind of talk about how like folks from the, my neighborhood never really went to school uh, I'm, I'm sorry they really never went to college and so the whole college experience or the whole college, college opportunity was very foreign to to me and my mom now you it's not even like you just went to college you went to one of the <laughs> most prestigious universities in the country and the world, you went to Notre Dame. Um, so I'm assuming you were a pretty good student in high school uh, to at least get a scholarship from Coach Holtz. Well, it was kind of interesting what happened was um, it, it, after my junior year, uh, there was a, a coach from Notre Dame came up to the school and, and my head coach's office was in the basement. So we kind of, we went downstairs and the coach said, you know, hey, how would you like to come to the University of Notre Dame? And I was like, wow, you know, I would love to, but my mom doesn't like to fly. Uh huh. Now, I'm, I'm going to pause here for a little bit because I, so I, I grew up in Chicago. Yep. I was, my high school was 93 miles away from campus, from Notre Dame. And our apartment was like 96 miles away from Notre Dame. Okay. Yep. That's just a small caveat for folks, right? So the coach goes, you know, hey, you know, why not come to Notre Dame? I was like, I would love to, but my mom doesn't like to fly. Mm -hmm. And he kind of looked at me kind of strange. So what do you mean your mom doesn't like to fly? And I said, well, there's no way my mom would fly to France to see me play. <laughs> and he kind of looked at me and said, what do you mean? I was like, well, you guys got the hunt, the, the, the church and the hunchback guy, right? And he was like, what the hell? This kid doesn't even know where the hell Notre Dame is. <laughs> so I say that story because not only folks didn't know, I mean, folks didn't know about going to college in my neighborhood, yep. but no one really ever went to big schools from my high school. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, when you think about kind of my exposure to college athletics, it, it just wasn't there. And so I didn't know about a school that was 96 miles away from our apartment. And that happens to be Notre Dame. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, 
And especially, so you didn't know anything really about like the, what the tradition held in that school. Cause it's one Nothing. of the, the biggest, like when you think football tradition, you think Notre Dame is usually one of the top programs. That's crazy to think about. Well, it's, it's nothing. I mean, I didn't, I didn't think anything of it because I didn't know, you know, I mean, yeah. that really wasn't, I mean, I didn't go to my high school to play football. I didn't go, I didn't play football to get a scholarship. I mean, that, that all kind yeah. of uh, happened, but for me, it was a vocational school. So I went to Chicago vocational high school to take a vocation, to learn a trade. Mm-hmm. So I could hopefully earn enough money to get my mom out of our neighborhood. Okay, so this was just a whole, what was your thought process when they said you could go to college to go to Notre Dame, when you already were kind of in the process of learning a trade? Well, it was kind of interesting because going into my, so I worked kind of, uh, there were city jobs in mm-hmm. Chicago for low, low income families um, around the summertime. Yep. And so I had worked those like maybe the last five years of my life. And my high school football coach told me, you know, hey, if you really dedicate yourself, your the summer of your senior of going into your senior year, and throughout the year, you may have an opportunity for a college to pay for your education. Mm-hmm. So I was like, so so that's kind of how I kind of understood the the process of scholarships. So I talked to my mom, my, my high school football coach and, and, and my mom sat down and uh, we kind of talked about it and it would be hard for me to, to, to train as hard as I need to, I needed to train and mm-hmm. still work. Now over the summer, I'd make like maybe 15 or five or $2,000 or something like that. And I would give that to my mom to kind of help pay for the bills throughout the year. Mm-hmm. So by me, making the sacrifice and not working a summer job, like, you know, and it was like cleaning up trash in parks or something like that. I mean, it wasn't like really a big deal, but our family needed that money. And so, you know, she was thinking, you know, Hey, we need the money, but if you have an opportunity for a school to pay for your education, then why don't you go ahead? And so that really taught, taught me kind of not only the sacrifices that, my mom would make in the future, but she understood the opportunity that I had. And so, I mean, and it really doesn't sound like a big deal or it really doesn't sound like a, sound like a lot to people, but that $1,500 that I would have earned over the summer would have really helped my, me and my mom out. Like and so by, day. by not doing that um, and, and really kind of spending that time training and then having the chance my senior year to go on and, 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 and be in a position where schools offered new scholarship. Now, did, with Notre Dame coming in to recruit you, did other colleges also come in to recruit you? Because the recruiting scene in the 80s and 90s is a lot different than it is nowadays, right. where it's, there's so many websites where, like, once one Power 5 school jumps in on a kid, it's, you'll see 10 more jump in. So I wasn't sure what, uh, if any other schools reached out. Well, it was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> so the first letter I received was from Indiana State. Okay. And basically it said, hey, um, we, we'd like to offer you a scholarship to play football. And so I called the guy, like, as soon as I got it, I was like, okay, I'm in. And this is my <laughs> junior year. And the guy's like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I just got this letter from you guys. You know, I'm, I'm in. He, he, and he wanted to say, look, kid, this letter went out to like 50,000 kids, right? I mean, you know, this is a, this, this was just a, a recruiting letter. And, but he didn't say that. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, I want to come. He's like, well, you know, let's just wait a little bit. And thank you for calling. But I think you may have some offers for some bigger schools. I'm, 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 just, I'm, I'm just thinking yeah. you may. And I was like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I forgot the, the coach's name, but I just thought that was funny because Again, I was so naive about the process. I didn't know, you know, this was just kind of an invitation letter. You know, it didn't say, hey, we're going to pay four years for scholarship. It said, hey, we are interested in the possibility of offering your scholarship. But I didn't see all that stuff, right? I just saw scholarship, they'll pay. I was like, hey, I'm in. You get that, your eyes like light up. You're, you're also gun ho about uh, calling like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to college. I'm going to play. Right, 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 exactly. And then after, like, like you were mentioning, after the – the bigger schools got involved. 
Um, I had, I, I narrowed my schools down to five. They were uh, Northwestern, Notre Dame, Miami, Michigan, and University of Illinois. So you narrow it down. I hear you've got Notre Dame and Miami in there. Now that, you guys, it's the classic uh, Catholics versus convicts rivalry game um, that the, the ESPN documentary about it, everybody talks about it anytime there's talk of Notre Dame Miami ever playing. So was that kind of when you guys played them, did that come into your mind? Like I could have gone here. I, I could have been a part of this team or I could be where I'm at in Notre Dame. Well, it was kind of interesting because as I, as the recruiting process started, mm -hmm. um, I never took my visit to Miami, although I was going to. Okay. But there was also another guy, another player in Chicago named Russell Maryland. Mm -hmm. And he went to Miami. And I'm thinking, had I gone to Miami, I'd probably be sitting on the bench. So I'm kind of glad I did not go to Miami <laughs> because Russell wound up, and, and I know Russell very well, he wound up being, uh, I think, the number one pick or something like that. But he went to the Dallas Cowboys and had a phenomenal year or a phenomenal career, but it wasn't, it was interesting because I shared with my teammates when I was at Notre Dame that I was recruited by Miami and so a lot of other guys. And so there wasn't that, that stigma of Miami being this great phenomenal world beater like it had been in the past mm -hmm. for Notre Dame. Okay. Because I think the last game they played them, I think Miami beat them like 58 to nothing or 58 to 12. Yeah, it was just some crazy, crazy score. And so, and a lot of the guys on the team were actually from the Miami area, like Pat Terrell. Um, I mean, like all of his boys went to Miami. So we never looked at them as being like the superior team. We just looked at them as kind of being equal opponents. Mm -hmm. And so I think that had a lot to do with kind of our success against them. That's it. I think a lot of the media probably hyped it up as them being that superior team, just because it seemed like the offense they ran just seemed like they maybe had better athletes because they're putting up big numbers every game you see you're in there throwing the ball all over team. So do you, that mm -hmm. was part of it? Like the media oh, sure, sure. Mind it up to be. And for, for us, I mean, it was Holtz's, it was his third year, mm -hmm. and I mean, he had literally this defense that no one ever, no one knew any of the names on the defense. Um, I mean, we were so not even underrated, but like so unheralded. I'm like, like no one knew. I think we may have been returning like maybe four starters at the most, mm -hmm. and those guys weren't all Americans or anything. So you know, it was just one of those situations where, I mean, we really kind of really kind of snuck up on people. And if you think about that first game that we beat Michigan that year, um, had Reggie Ho, who was our kicker, not been available, or if he missed, I think he had like four or five field goals that game. So, you know, if he misses one of those, we don't win, you know, so we don't win the national championship. So it wasn't like our, our team was like this, this big time well known team with a lot of returning starters. And you know, when you think about that, I mean, that was, that was Rocket's first year. It's yep. so like no one knew who, who, who he was. I mean, we knew who he was in practice, but no one really saw him. Right. Right. But the year before that is there's the story uh, I've read about it. I, it was in the documentary about the Catholics first convicts game. Um, I mean, I believe it was your freshman year. Notre Dame wasn't great. And you guys lose the last game of the season and you're the only kid that is crying about it. You're upset about it, and you hadn't played it down. And I just thought, like, I thought that story was awesome. I actually didn't believe it the first time I saw it in the documentary. I'm like, that just seems too good to be true, <laughs> that you turn into, like, the player you do, and then – but this is, like, the, the start of it. Uh, so would you like to speak about that a little bit, like that whole – Sure, sure. It, it, was, it was really interesting because I had not heard about that and I forgot about it. And okay. it wasn't until one of my friends came up to me and said, hey, I just finished Lou Holtz's book. I didn't know you cried after the Texas A&M game your first year. I'm like, what are you talking about? 
He's like, dude, there's a whole section on there where Hopes talks about you crying after the game. You didn't even play. And I'm like, what? So I go, and of course, you know, you don't read the books of your coaches that they write. You know, now I've read them all, but back then I didn't. And I looked at it, I was like, oh my gosh, I remember that. And so, you know, I had spent the whole year on the practice squad. And for those of you who might not know what a practice squad is, that's the, basically the folks who practice against the, the starters during the year. Mm-hmm. So I was a, a practice player on defense. Therefore, I would go against our first team offense. And so I spent the whole year doing that. And I felt like after the game, I felt like all the practice that I had put in was for not because we lost. And so, I mean, yeah, I was crying after the game. And apparently Holt saw that. And again, this is from his book. He talks about how, you know, he didn't know how he was going to get me on the field, but he wanted me to get on the field and have, I think his quote was he wanted fire eaters like me because of my passion. And I look at that now, and I mean, obviously he, he wouldn't tell me that when after the game, but for, for him to think that highly of me and the passion that I had for Notre Dame and the game of football, I mean, I'm just, I'm hugely honored. Now, there were times in practice during, you know, going into that first season or going into my second year where he kicked me out of practice tons of times because I was getting into fights. And I mean, so Needless to say, I mean, I, I wasn't just this kind of model citizen that he's like, oh, hey, let's put on the field. They'll be OK. I mean, I had some issues and I had to work through. And like I said, I was fighting with my teammates. And and I mean, luckily, I've never I was never kicked out of a game. But that was always the. The threat that Coach Holt talked about was, look, you know, you're a, you're a big part of this team. If we lose you, we're not sure what we're going to do. And we can't lose you to fight it. Right. Now, the so then you start, you're on that defense with it. It's still to this day, it's kind of a I'd say a no name defense. But if you're a Notre Dame fan, you know all those names like Stonebreaker, you, uh, Todd Light. I mean, like that defense was awesome and was really the deciding factor in the Miami game, which led you guys up to the national championship. Would you say that was the best game of your career? That Miami game, I know you had some big games in the Orange Bowl, but. Um, selfishly for me, I mean, I, I think about uh, a couple games that that was a great game. Now that was the best game that I was that I played in. I mean, the fans, the the the, the level of competition, my teammates, I mean, that was great. But my personal two favorites, and I have to say two because one was my last game that I played at Notre Dame, and I didn't realize how important that would be to me until after the game. But the first game, kind of a a bookend to my career. The first game was my sophomore year, the first game that I had ever played in. Okay. And I was the the starting nose tackle against Michigan. And, you know, here you got this 19 year old kid who doesn't know squat about, you know, Big Ten football or, you know, I've never, I mean, the biggest crowd I played in in front of was, I think, maybe like, like 85 or 75 people or something like that. I mean, now I'm playing in front of 60,000 people at Notre Dame Stadium under the light. So that was a great game. And I had, I only remember this because it was kind of my, the first game I ever played it. I had uh, 10 tackles and like a sack and a half. I mean, I have no idea where that came from, but so that was my first game. And then I was, was going to think about my last game, which was a game that we played University of Colorado and we actually lost in kind of the last seconds of the game by, this phantom uh, play or clip that happened to Rocky when you returned a, uh, uh, a punt. But the idea that that game meant so much to me, I didn't realize that after, and it wasn't so much that we lost, but it was, I realized that it was the last game of my career. Mm-hmm. And I was sobbing. There's a photo of me that's a pretty famous photo in kind of Notre Dame lore that I'm sitting on the bench and I'm just sobbing and sobbing. And it was because my, it was the end of my Notre Dame football career. And unfortunately you fast forward less than 24 hours later. And that's when I found my mom who had died of a heart attack uh, after the game. Uh, so some, and I talked to her after the game, um, 
but it was sometime between the last phone call and when I found her that she had passed away. Gotcha. Yeah. That's how, how did your mom really influence you through your time at Notre Dame? Was she able to make it to your home games? Like what, what was her impact on you during your playing career as a member of the Notre Dame football team? Well, it kind of has to, it actually has to start kind of before that because she actually didn't want me to play football. And so my freshman year, the coach saw me walking in the hallway and he was like, okay, who are you? (laughs) You You're, I don't know who you are, like the biggest kid in the school. I was like, hey, my name's Chris. He's like, do you play football? I was like, no. He's like, well, I'm a football coach. Do you want to play? I was like, sure. He's like, okay, well, have your mom, have your parents sign the slip. So uh-huh. I took it home and she was like, absolutely not. You're not playing. I don't want you to get hurt. There's no way. So I went back to school and said, hey, I can't play. He's like, what? He's like, no, my mom said I can't play. And he's like, oh, my God. So he went and talked to her. She said no. So, but I liked hanging around with the guys around the team. Mm-hmm. And, and that was really important to me that I was around some positive guys, really, really cool guys. So I asked my mom again. She said no. So then I, I forged her signature on the permission slip. And so I started to play. My, my high school coach was happy. And, but, but I started to get, I started to come home later and later from school. Yep. And so my mom was like, what's going on? I was like, well, I'm involved in extracurricular activities. Kind of not lying, but kind of not telling her what it was. Stretch the truth a little bit. Exactly. So it wasn't until like I brought home like, like some shoulder pads or my, my, my uniform because it was so smelly. Because mm-hmm. we didn't, I mean, it was a public school. So we, we would hang ourselves up in a locker but it would stink. And so eventually we would have to bring stuff home. So my mom saw it and she was like, you've been lying to me. So she was crying and he kind of had this really, this really interesting kind of tough conversation about why I was doing it. And I told her that I was around positive men. My high school coach was a huge influence on me, learned how to set goals, discipline. There were all these things that I was kind of um, new to that I had never experienced before. So she allowed me to play, but interestingly enough, she never went to any of my high school games until the last game my senior year. And she watched the whole game like through her, through her, through her <laughs> hands. And then after the game, I went up to her, gave her a big hug and she was like, oh my God, you were really good. And I'm like, I'm getting a scholarship to Notre Dame. I'm like, yeah, pretty good. She's like, oh, I didn't know you were that good. I'm like, wow, thanks. So, but I say that to say that after that, she went to all the home games at Notre Dame and it was really great. She had a great experience. And then actually, I don't know if you can see, there's a, a photo of my mom behind my shoulder. Let me sort of grab it. Oh, yeah. Um, I can show it to you. So this is actually her signing an article. Well, here, let me tell you about the story. So that's her at, at, after a game. Yep. So after every game, I'd come out of the locker room, I'd look for my mom. And I'd see her, I'd give her a hug, and then I'd kind of hang out with fans, sign autographs and stuff like that. Well, this one time, and this is actually the Miami game after the 88. So this is 89 mm-hmm. in South Bend at the Miami game. And I come out of the locker room. I don't see her. I'm like, where's she at? And then I see this long line. Well, the week before this Miami game, there was an article in Sports Illustrated about me. And there was a picture of me and her sitting on our couch, oh. or our couch in our apartment. And so you could actually, it's, it's really kind of crazy, but you could actually see her kind of signing this autograph as fan, but there was this huge line. So I actually had to wait in line for my mom. <laughs> so it was kind of crazy. But yeah, so I mean, and, and she had a great time. And so it was kind of a cool experience for her to kind of, you know, experience this, you know, at least every weekend for, you know, the, the, last, uh, the last three years of her life. That's awesome. Now, before we move on to like your NFL career, uh, do you wish the style of the half cage with the crop top would come back to the NFL? <laughs> the the style with the hip pads popping out, do you wish that was uh, something that might come back? Well, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, you could say I got a helmet back there. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so old school that it's, it's, it's hilarious. Yep. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm all for double sessions and contact and everything else because without football, you know, you can't now – Granted, it has to be safe now, right? So maybe right. more water breaks, maybe maybe not as much contact, but the idea of now having a safe environment, I'm I am all for that. But I'm also all for all for discipline, 
um, running laps, you know, after practice, if you do bad, uh, if you come late to practice, I mean, there, there's so many different things that, that I would like to see implemented now, but, you know, as just a fan, I really can't, I mean, like I couldn't be a coach right now because I get fired like after the first yep. week because I yell at a kid and kids like, I want to transfer. Like, well, get the hell out my, get, get the hell off my field, you know? Yeah. But you know, you, you really can't talk to kids that way now, but you know, so I'm so used to kind of this old school environment that, um, you know, I would welcome back those things, you know, kind of an old school helmet and, and kind of, you know, me, me putting my jersey halfway. I mean, the, the half cage seems like it's making a bit of a comeback. Uh, Notre Dame alum, Mike McGlinchey, he rocks it in the NFL, but there's a few guys that wear it. But I, that's, I think, one of the coolest looks is the one bar right down the middle. I didn't even know right. they made the mini helmets like you have. Yeah. With the, the one bar down the middle. I think that's yeah. awesome. And see, it's, again, it's, uh, I don't know if I'm going to lose my wire here, but I mean, I had, the, I had that, so I got the, the one, can you see that? Yeah, that's awesome. The one bar there, and then also, even the helmet I wore with the Bears, I mean, it, this is even simpler. So, I mean, it was, this is just yeah. kind of helmet like that. So, again, you know, that's, that's just me being old school. That's awesome. Now you get, it's, it's kind of nice. You get selected by the bears in the 91 draft. Um, it, it's obviously a bummer. Your mom's not able to see you play in the NFL, but you're still close to where you grew up. How, how much did that mean to you to play for the Chicago bears? It, it was just literally like a dream come true. And it was one of those things where, although I didn't, I never, as a kid, I never thought I was going to be on the Bears, but we always watched them. So I remember watching games with my mom and she was a crazy fan. Like she would throw like her slippers at the TV and it, it's, I mean, she was a very passionate Bear fan, but it was funny because after graduation from Notre Dame, I mean, I spent the next seven and a half years, six and a half years, yes, uh, seven years in an environment that I knew like the back of my hand. And so football for me was the farthest I had played this game was, you know, uh, 90 miles away from my house. And then now like I'm playing professionally for the bears for seven years, you know? So it was one of those things where like you had to pinch me really because I wore number 50 in high school because of Mike Singletary. And now I had a chance to play with Mike Singletary for three years. So, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, I had a great, great professional career, although I didn't, I didn't start my first two years, but it was just this amazing, amazing experience that I had a chance to kind of play with the idols that I grew up watching, which was just amazing. I mean, I missed Walter Payton by a year because he actually retired in 91. Mm -hmm. and so I didn't have a chance to play with him, but he was always in the locker room and he was always on the sideline of the games. And, and I grew up watching him. And then I was fortunate enough that um, there's this uber famous commercial that Walter Payton had in Chicago where he, it was the, um, it was a commercial for United Way. And they showed him running through neighborhoods in the Chicago area. And then he would end up like running at, 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 into Soldier Field with a whole bunch of kids around him. And I remember that was like, it was yesterday. And then United Way asked me to kind of do my version of that commercial. I didn't run through all the neighborhoods. I thought that was kind of sacred because that, that was just, you know, yeah. Walter Payton's thing. But it was so cool to kind of be, to have my name in kind of the same conversation about um, United Way, which is a great charity with Walter Payton. And, and really that kind of sums up my professor, I mean, yes, I had a great time, although we never made a Super Bowl or anything like that. I had a great, great run in the NFL. Now, being so you you play with Chicago, you're playing for the Bears, like that's you said it's a dream come true. Um, you had a pretty good career in Chicago. Uh, you make a Pro Bowl. What was it like going from Chicago to Washington for that one year? Was that a difficult transition? It wasn't even a year. I mean, literally it was, I got cut, I think like the second week in October. So let's say it was October 15th. So October 16th, I was signed with the Redskins 
and literally was on a plane. And then we didn't make the, the, the Redskins didn't make the playoffs that year. So literally I was there in a rented apartment with rented furniture for like a month and a half. So, you know, and then at, at that point, and selfishly for me, football for me meant playing in Chicago. And so I knew that if I couldn't play again, and I had um, a plan to go to law school after I was finished playing in the NFL. So although I could have played a couple more years, um, it wasn't in Chicago. So for me, you know, in, in the big and wrong, and I, I love the game of football. I think it's a great, great learning tool for our young people, but I knew there was more out there for me. And so I wasn't just going to be a, a football player. And so I knew that, you know, hey, if football, if the passion is gone for me, then why not retire now and go to law school? Gotcha. Now, to, when you were in the NFL playing with the Bears, how was Coach Ditka as a coach? It was awesome. Again, I, I spent uh, two years with him. They fired him uh, in 93, which was, my, which was my third year. But it was one of those things where, you know, since I can remember, he was the coach for the Bears. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of this funny story about how my senior year in high school, I was at a all-state banquet and Mike Ditka gave the speech at the, at the banquet. But my mom and I got there about an hour before the, the event started and Ditka was in the lobby just kind of hanging out. And my mom were sitting there and she was like, hey, there's Mike Ditka. Go over there and say hi. <laughs> now, I'm 18. I think I just turned 17. Or excuse me, I just turned 18. I'm like, there's no way I'm going over there. She's like, you yeah, no. go over there. If, if not, I'm going to go. And I'm like, no, you're not. So she went. And I'm like, oh, my God. So she goes over there and they're talking for like a minute. And she turns around and looks at me and he kind of waves me over. And I'm like, oh, my God. Mike Ditka <laughs> just waving over. And my mom is, gonna, is, is embarrassing the shit out of me. This is crazy. So I go over there and I'm just like frozen. I don't say anything. And he's kind of, hey, you know, hey, your mom tells me you're a great player. CVS, you know, that's the high school that Dick Buckus went to. He's a famous bear, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting there like st stunned. I mean, I'm not saying a word, but somehow at the end of the conversation, I was like, Coach Dick, can you remember my name in four years? He's like, oh, yeah, sure, sure, no problem, no problem. But, I mean, again, I'm not saying that he remembered that, that conversation. But when he called on draft day, you know, I was like, yes, I'm in. And I was like, you don't remember this, but we met my high – and he was like, oh, that's a great story. That's terrific, blah, blah, blah. So um, I, I went into it a little enamored because, you know, he was Mike Ditka, one of the famous coaches for the Bears. And, but it was great kind of being on the team with him. And I think a lot of players liked him because he was a former player. And so he kind of had, he was a, a real players coach. I mean, there were things, he's like, as long as you got it done, you know, he's happy with, he's not really concerned about how you get to the end result, just that you're, you're able to do it. And then you retired from the NFL, you go back to Notre Dame, you go to law school at Notre Dame. What was it like being back uh, after you played in the NFL? Like what, what was the feeling? And I'm not sure how many people, I, I wouldn't advise this at all. I mean, I would at least advise like take a year off or something because it was such a weird transition for me. I had, I was 28 years old. Um, I had a whole bunch of money in my pocket and I just retired from the NFL and I go back to school. Like who the hell does that, right? I mean, who the hell goes, to, and then it's not even like, I went back to get my undergrad. I mean, I go back to, I go to law school, which is one of the hardest things probably yeah. behind med school. Right. And so I'm like, what? And so my, after my first year, I'm like, what am I doing here? This is crazy. But it was one of those things that, you know, I, I wanted to become an attorney and kind of help those in need because I had a foundation that I started in 93 helping people. And as opposed to kind of passing out food, which is what we did, I wanted to help change and form policy on the uh, on the larger stage, and I felt that at that time the only, the only way you can do that is if you become an attorney and help change policy. About halfway through, after my third, after my second year, 
I realized that I did not want to become an attorney and I hated law school, but I wanted to finish it because I started and also because I paid $120,000. So I, I had to finish. Might as well finish so, it at that point. Pardon me? I said, might as well finish it up at that point. Exactly, exactly. But again, I mean, in, in the back of my mind, like, I'm like, how many guys retire from the NFL and go to law school? I mean, it, I just thought that was just the, the weirdest thing. Um, so when at Notre Dame, so you, you saw it as – a law student and as a football player, what was your favorite tradition? Um, whether it be on the football team or something around campus, uh, but just your favorite tradition, one that you'll never forget. Uh, as well, it's kind of, it's kind of really interesting. I went to undergrad, went there for law school, and then I actually went back and worked in the athletic department. Okay. So I spent like a total, of like almost 20 years in sub So it's kind of, it's really weird. So it's almost like my second home. But for me, there's two things that I, I always think about. Um, the first one is for fans. Mm -hmm. And that is, and I forgot when they started this tradition, but it was one of those situations where if you came up the night before a game, you could watch the managers paint the helmets. Okay. And so... And um, you mentioned that you went to a game, but you, you never went to a game on campus yet, right? Correct. I have not. Okay. So when you go, and I'm sure you will go hopefully this year, yes. um, there, there's this famous, uh, right by the main entrance, there's a tunnel. And this is the famous tunnel that the players walk through. Well, way back in the day, during... I'm sorry, the night before the game, the managers would paint the helmets with real gold flakes uh, the night before the game. And what people would do is they would bring like shoes or they'd bring like a hat or they would bring like a t-shirt. They would bring anything and the managers would, would, would like paint their, their shoes for them if they wanted, which I thought was really cool. That's awesome. So having a chance for a fan to kind of like experience, and people would take pictures of it, I mean, I never saw it until afterward because, you know, I mean, I'm in a hotel room by this time, but it was so interesting because that was like a, a, a way for the fans to kind of really kind of feel as though they were like part of the team, let's say, because their shoes got painted gold or their hats painted gold by the managers just the night before the game. So that was just from a manager, just from a fan standpoint, I think that was a great, uh, great tradition. But then also... For the players, um, what I loved was we would have a mass before the game, and this was in one of the one of the chapels in one of the dorms across campus. And it was a tiny room; it was it was a tiny chapel, but somehow we fit like 105 guys in there and coaches. And I remember, and this happened every home game. I'd look around, and I'm you know guys got their you know they're staring. Um, forward, you know, they have their game face on. And I always thought about like, wow, you know, th th these are my brothers and I'm not trying to equate sports with war by any means, but the, the terminology that folks use, like, Hey, this is, these are the brothers I'm going to war with, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to play our opponent and we want to beat them, but I'm going to do it with these guys in this room. And so I remember it being kind of like the equivalent to like being quiet before the storm. And yeah. so being in the locker room, I'm sorry, being in this chapel with them and kind of looking around, I, I always thought this was like, it was like the coolest, coolest thing. And then at the end of every um, mass, the, the priest giving the sermon would give each player a, a little medallion. And I remember taking that. I used to wear it. I used to wear it during the game. I used to tie a shoelace around my neck and I had the, um, the, the medallion on. And it, it was just a, a tradition that I did. But it was just one of those things where it's kind of like I felt this, this amazing bond with my teammates. And I knew how special that was. And when I look back, back on it now, I mean, I just think that that, would, that that was just an amazing experience. And then after, after the mass, we would do, we would walk about a half, maybe about a quarter of a mile from that dorm over to the stadium, 
which is what they call the player's walk. And then they would have people would like form a line or they would form a tunnel for us to kind of walk through. And it was, that was just an amazing experience. That's unreal. That's just, I, I think the schools that have that deep tradition just makes it so much better. Cause I think when I, you think football tradition, I think Notre Dame, and then I think army and Navy, the service, sure. academies, the, but that just any school that has a tradition like that, you just can't beat it. It's unreal. Yeah. Yeah. And then being part of it is just really, really cool. What's your thoughts right now uh, on the state of Notre Dame football? Uh, the past few years, it's been pretty good regular season. Then the postseason is very tough because face off either in Alabama, a Clemson and Ohio state, it's been a little difficult when you hit the postseason as a fan, but watching them in the regular season has been awesome. What's your thoughts on it? Well, and, and I think it is a, a great regular season. Um, they have some great competition. Obviously, last year was just kind of this weird fluke that happened with, with every team throughout the country. But having success during the year is important. Mm -hmm. But what's ultimately important is the games that you win after the regular season. And that's where they've been challenged, right? That's where they've been blown out. Um, I had such high hopes of the game against Clemson because we went in there the first game that they played in last year and we played like our hair was on fire. I mean, we played awesome. like there was not, I mean, it, that, that game was one of the best games that I've watched. And I was fortunate enough to, to play in one of the best games, right? Every yeah. college I played in that one, but to watch, and obviously I'm a little, little biased because it wasn't our name, but that game was amazing. And I think even if you would have had uh, um, uh, the quarterback, Trevor Lawrence, in there, I think it would have been the same result. And, and I only say that because I think his backup threw like for like 500 yards or something like that. So oh, it went off. It, it, it's not like they would have, if Trevor Lawrence would have been able to put up like a thousand yards or anything, but they, they were just on fire. And so I had so much hope going into the game, into the first playoff game when they were going to play Clemson. And then they did not do well at all. And I was like, oh, you know, this, this, is gonna, this, is, this is how it's going to be all over again. And then they have a chance to play Alabama in the first round. And it was like, oh, my gosh, what happened? So I think that they're not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's going to take Coach Kelly and his staff to get those players, and, and Coach Kelly even talked about this, that they feel as though they have the offensive and defensive linemen that they need in order to compete. They just need now the skill positions, the running backs, the defensive backs, the receivers, the quarterback, that will give them the opportunity to beat an Alabama and, and beat a Clemson. Now, is that going to happen overnight? No. Um, you know, this was a conversation that started with Coach Kelly in 2012 when Alabama beat them. And they said, well, we need to get bigger, stronger. And we did. It took eight years, but they finally got there. Now, you know, hopefully it's not going to take another eight years for them to get skilled players there. Now, as a defensive lineman, do you believe that Notre Dame is the real O-line U? I think it's a big argument between – Notre Dame and Wisconsin on who puts in the – I mean, I'm biased, I'll, I'll admit it, but I still believe deep down Notre Dame puts in – puts some of the best O-linemen in the NFL. Uh, I just wanted to know what, you, what your thoughts on that. I, I think it'll be a little bit of the same, but – Oh, sure, I, absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you talk about folks who have made their mark in, a, in an environment. You also talk – I mean, offensive linemen, you, you could also talk about – I mean, you can make a case for uh, um, the uh, um, the uh, 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 tight end position as well. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, there have been some great Notre Dame tight ends that have came out or that are in the NFL. Rudolph. So I, I think the right. I mean, I, I think those two positions. Uh, and you also talk about kind of our newest one, which is Cole Komet with the Bears. Awesome. So you look at what he's been able to accomplish as a rookie. You look at what other folks have done. You look at the offensive linemen in particular. Um, they're either winning it or I know the runner up for the Joe Moore Award, which is an award that one of that Aaron Taylor, who was an offensive lineman at Notre Dame, 
and is currently on CBS uh, Sports doing uh, the, the college football reporting. Yep. Um, he actually created that award in honor of Joe Moore. And it's this huge, like, half-ton award that kind of travels around the country to the team that, that wins it or the, the, the offensive line that wins it. And so I know it's been in their name's place a couple times and um, it's been Alabama a couple times, but when, when you think about offensive linemen, I, I definitely think folks think about Notre Dame. Last little Notre Dame bit. Uh, I've seen a couple mock drafts with the Notre Dame linebacker safety, uh, Jeremiah Owusa koromoa possibly going to the Bears. Would that be uh, something you'd be a fan of? Absolutely. Are you kidding me? That that would be great, man. I'd be on the phone with him in two seconds going, hey, congrats. You know, if you need to know any, any places to go, I'll, you know, I, I'll hook you up. But, you know, the, the idea of players or, or Notre Dame players getting drafted in the first round is really important because that's what kids look at now. Yeah. And so when kids are being recruited uh, by these colleges, they're all concerned about, you know, how many first round draft picks have you had? Uh, what's the success you've had? Well, if we're not winning national championships, at least we can get kids drafted. And yeah. so hopefully that, that will be a, an additional attraction for these young kids being recruited by Notre Dame now. Now, you spent some time as an athletic director. You started at Prairie State College, a community college. Um, what was that experience like? You were there for, what, three years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what was that whole experience? Uh, it, it, was, it was great. I mentioned – before that I spent some time in Notre Dame's athletic department as well. And I love the opportunity because I learned kind of what to accomplish from an administrative standpoint with when you have an unlimited budget, mm -hmm. which is great. But then being the athletic director at a community college, it's the exact opposite. And yeah. so, you know, I was able to kind of learn how to do more with less and which obviously served me in a way where I was able to uh, be, be, become a division one athletic director at Chicago state. So, you know, all those experiences kind of served me well in order for me to have that position. And I, and I loved it. And it was just really an opportunity to create an environment that was uh, safe for our student athletes. And I mean, one of the things that, that I learned from a ton of my mentors was always keep in mind the, the student athlete first and then and that's just everything when, when you're going over budgets when you're um looking at uh facility opportunities just always keep the, the student athlete in mind and so you add that mantra but then you also add the fact that i was a former student athlete and i really felt as though i gave a hundred percent of myself to the student athletes and the athletic department and then you move, like you said, to Chicago State. You were there for about 14 months and then left. What was the, what, like the, what was it like being at Chicago State versus, I know you said a little bit how the budget's different, but uh, dealing with the athletes, how was that at Chicago State? Uh, it was great. I mean, it, as were the athletes were, were wherever I was. And, you, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's been a, I spent a lot of time in some great places. A, a athlete at Notre Dame is just the same as, as an athlete at Prairie State or Chicago State. Obviously, the, the, there's a difference in talent, mm -hmm. but they want the same things. They want the opportunity to compete and, and go to school. And so if you provide that for them, then you've done your job. Now, the challenge is, you know, doing it in a safe way. I mean, I, I missed the whole COVID thing with athletic departments, which I'm, I'm glad I was not in in at the time because I mean I've, I've talked to athletic directors and this by far has been the most challenging experience that they've ever had to go through but really being able to provide the mental health and wellness opportunities for student athletes are important um, you know there were so many things I learned from Notre Dame and Prairie State and Chicago State that I was able to kind of implement at the other places that I've been because Again, the mantra of keeping the athlete first is important, but also kind of learning from those experiences was kind of an education in itself. Nice.
Now you've got the Chris Zorich podcast uh, where you talk to a lot of uh, notable Notre Dame alum. Um, you had Stonebreaker on, Jerome Bettis. Uh, I think that's awesome. So how has that been kind of just connecting with athletes of different generations too? Like you recently had Stefan Tuit on. How has that been? It's really been an amazing experience. And I have to give credit to my wife. She's the one who kind of wanted me to kind of do something with my my, my day job where I'm an executive re- recruiter. Um, I was able to spend some time at home. And she was like, you know, you need to do something. I'm like, what do you mean I'm doing something? She's like, no, you need to do something you enjoy. And she's like, well, you should do a podcast. I'm like, what are you talking about? Anyway, make a, make a long story short, um, <laughs> I really thought about doing guys that I used to kind of hang out with. And so my first guest was actually the quarterback from the 88 team, Tony Rice. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I did it on a Zoom and I didn't even know how to turn off the Zoom. And it was just hilarious. And I I still have that up on on my YouTube page because I want folks to see it because I kind of came from there to now a point where, you know, I can run names across the bottom and there's there's a a crawler that goes uh, beneath the podcast and stuff like that. And then we're also kind of on um, Spotify and Apple um, podcasts and things like that. But it's great because I have a chance to kind of hang out with guys that I played with. And like you said, guys that I didn't play with. I mean, I didn't play with Stefan to it, but just kind of learning kind of what his experience was like going to Notre Dame, what is the competition in the NFL, but then also talking to folks like Joe Theismann, um, you know, who was an academic All-American outside of an, uh, an All-American, or even Rocky Blyer, who had half of his foot blown off in the Vietnam War, but still came back and won four Super Bowls. With, with the Pittsburgh Steelers. So it's a great selection of people. And it's almost like I've become like this, this modern day historian because I'm kind of learning all these kind of new things about Notre Dame. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, I love listening. I listened to the To It interview and I think he, it, it's just cool, I think. And same with Bettis, like you said, he was almost a linebacker, which is <laughs> something like you learn these little things right. that, an outsider like a fan doesn't really know unless you're in that locker room which I think is pretty sick yeah and and I think one of the things that I've learned and that people have even said it um is that because I kind of share that environment with although we may have been 10-15 years apart sometimes or just maybe even a row away in the locker room um there's an automatic bond and yeah. so now I'm getting the response to questions that regular interviewers might not get, or the fact that, I mean, I remember talking to Stefan and he kind of hesitated a little bit and he was like, man, I didn't realize I was going to talk about this, but, you know, I came from a, a domestic uh, abuse household. And I was like, wow, like, I mean, that wasn't part of what I wanted to talk talk to him about but it came out anyway and so I think it's it's gratifying to know that they feel comfortable enough to kind of share those things with me but it's also great because the especially in in Stefan's case I mean he's going to be a future kind of Notre Dame legend right I mean he was a great player at Notre Dame but he's even going to be a better player in the NFL and so it's, it's those types of individuals that you want to be involved in the program. And so having a chance to kind of spend some time with him and learning about him, I think it's just a great opportunity. And, and even, I mean, I even learned a lot about guys I played with, for example, like Mike Stonebreaker. Um, I didn't hear the story about how um, the reason why he didn't play his junior year is because he was on, he was, he got in trouble with grades, but the reason why was because he went out, um, he was out at a party in Wisconsin um, the Saturday or the, the Sunday before he was supposed to take a, a stats final in summer school. And what made it even worse was that he was hanging out with some folks and the police came and they were looking for one of his buddies he was with. And so in order for him to dodge the police, he was underneath the deck um, in the water, uh, treading water for like a half an hour so they wouldn't see him. 
So, I mean, I didn't know that when I was there and it was, it was hilarious. And so having a chance to kind of hear those stories and, and I mean, uh, another one was, which is, was about uh, Tom Gatewood talked about being the, the, the first uh, black captain at, at Notre Dame and how hard it was because he got death threats. Um, folks, um, they, I mean, they just, and this was through the mail and, and on the phone and everything else. And, and you just don't hear about situations like that because you don't think about that because all you think about is these guys having a helmet on and these guys are scoring touchdowns for you, but you don't realize um, you know, what's happening in their lives during that time. And one other story I wanted to talk about was um, we had a little short of Rockets uh, interview, which is great. He talks about kind of what his thought was behind the famous uh, play where there was a, a phantom clip. Yeah. He kind of talks about how and he kind of waved it off and kind of waved with the coach Holtz and he told him he was going to run it back. I mean, so it's just kind of those things that if you're a Notre Dame fan, you have a chance to kind of relive um, these situations if you saw them. And if not, you have a chance to kind of learn about players that you may not have learned about. Like I was so fascinated by Rocky Blyer after I read his book and then I have a chance to actually interview him. So it was, it was just a great, great opportunity with this podcast. Who, who's on deck for you guest wise? Um, we have some folks I'm, I'm talking to uh, Joe Montana. We're trying to get uh, some time for him. Um, we're also trying to, in, actually this is kind of maybe not exciting for a lot of people, but we're actually coming up on our year um, of me doing this and actually Tony Rice was my first guest and the first week in May I'm going to have him on again just kind of doing like a, a a a anniversary edition of the Zorch podcast so I think that'll be fun so you know it's just um, an opportunity to listen to some old guys kind of hang out to talk about you know how great they were that's awesome Chris I appreciate you coming on talking some Notre Dame football I love it um, where can everybody find you and find the podcast on social media? Sure. Uh, it's called the Zorich Podcast. Uh, as I mentioned, you could either uh, find it on uh, Spotify or uh, iTunes. Um, but if you want to watch it, you can go to youtube.com slash Chris Zorich 50 and you'll see all the interviews there. And, and it's just, well, I just finished one with Frank Stams and we, we played together on the 88 team, but he was a couple years ahead of me. And so kind of even learning, and he was there in that transition between uh, Faust and Holtz. Okay. And one thing that a lot of people don't know, and I'm going to actually talk about this. Um, uh, we, we actually talked about it in the podcast was that Holtz was about to take a scholarship. And, you know, you fast forward a couple of years after that situation, and Frank Stam is, is an All-American. You know, he he practically. I mean, he had two sacks against uh, Walsh in that Miami game. He caused yeah. two fumbles. Um, he gets drafted in the second round. So you know, there's a very high. And then he also knocked uh, Rodney Pete out in the uh, USC game. So you know, if if Holtz takes a scholarship and he goes to the University of Akron or something like that, we might not win the national championship. So I just. It's funny because you hear these stories and you're just like, oh my God, or even if like you mentioned, I mean, what if Jerome Bettis didn't come to Notre Dame and because we were one of the only schools that wanted him to play tailback, but imagine if he had went to, to Penn State to play linebacker. You know, I mean, it, it, there's so many different scenarios that would have happened, but it's great to kind of have a chance to kind of hear these guys talk about these stories in their own words. It's crazy. It's like one big domino effect because – Bettis does it's it's just so weird because if Bettis like you said goes to Penn State and plays linebacker then you don't get a really his career in the NFL is so different the power back position is so different it, it's just crazy that like a lot of things people don't know like you, right. you guys right. talked about on that show and so having a chance to kind of and that's not like that's what I'm digging for but you know when you uncover those things it, it, it's great because it's like oh my gosh like had Tony Rice not gone to Notre Dame, like, you know, I mean, we have a little section called the Zorch Podcast Shorts, where there's only like, like five or 10 minute little excerpts 
of the interviews. And I did one with, with Tony on how Luke Holtz convinced him to come to Notre Dame. If he doesn't do that, you know, Tony goes to South Carolina, do we win a national championship? You know, I mean, so there's so many different things that I, I was I'm able to kind of find out. I want to say uncover because it's not like I'm trying to find information on guys, but it, 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 it's so interesting kind of learning about kind of this Notre Dame lore. And you would think as a former player, like I would know all this stuff anyway. That's awesome. Chris, I appreciate you coming on. Like I said, um, yeah, thank you for taking the time and coming on. And I, I love the show. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Andrew. I, I do appreciate that. And I'm, we're excited because, you know, we have a chance to kind of uh, share kind of learning stories that, and it's not just about exes. I make that point when I talk to these guys that I don't care about, you know, how many touchdowns you scored or how many sacks you had. I mean, because I did that too, right? I'm in the College Football Hall of Fame. So this isn't, you know, uh, in an in interview to kind of see who has the, who has the better stats. You know, I want to know, how you got involved in football. You, you know, I want to know all these things that I think a lot of people want to know in, right. in, in listening to a podcast. Thank you, Chris. And thank you guys for listening to this episode of the My Parents Office podcast. Stay tuned for more episodes we're going to be bringing to you guys. Thank you.